invite you to turn your Bibles to John 16.
and talk about how they relate to healing. Then I came in last week and talked about hope, and it seemed to go a different direction, and I read over my notes from last week, and, and it really didn't. We talked last week about the servant nature of Jesus. We talked about his desire to heal our brokenness, because he won't break our bruised greens. He won't stuff out our smoldering wicks. He wants to lead justice to victory. And we all want to see justice led to victory. Nothing, nothing makes us happier sometimes when you see somebody get what they deserve, and you see justice. It's just like, put them away. You know, put them away. And so, uh, and then when it happens, we're like, yes. But how often does that really happen? Because I got to think, I'm like, oh, wait, that would make us all happy, but why does it ever happen? It doesn't very happen very often. And we're all tired of injustice. We're tired of looking like, like injustice is winning right before our eyes. I get tired of looking at it, so I kind of stop looking at it. Because the only way, the only way to have it not affect you is to stop letting it affect you. Isaiah said all the nations will put their hope in his name. So that's what we do. We hope in his name because it's in his name. It, it, it's in him. So we have all the other stuff that we need. And the world wants you to believe that there are a lot of options out there. There are a lot of paths. And they all lead to God, they'll tell you. That's just not true. There really are only two ways to live. In Christ or not in Christ. There's... There's, if you're going to live not in Christ, I guess, I guess there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You know, you, you, can, you, can, you can be any one of a thousand other things. But those of us who have chosen to live in Christ have chosen to put to death the ways of the world and have chosen to live life through Jesus. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean we're sinless. We still make mistakes. We sin. We fall short of the glory of God. But we are in Him. Last week, we put our hope in Him. And this week, it's peace in Him. And next week, you already know the sermon about us for the next two weeks. Joy in Him. Love in Him. We're, we're going to be in Him. We're subject to, in the meantime, even though we're in Him, we're still in this world and we're subject to all kinds of stuff. We're subject to sickness. We're subject to accidents. We're subject to the poor choices of other people. Good God, if we could just get out from under the poor choices of other people. Right? I could do it being sick. It happens. You know, accidents, accident, depending on the severity of the accident, accidents happen. But poor choices of other people is probably the one that irritates me the most. All right? Because somebody else does something stupid, and it affects me or people that I know. And so we're not immune to that stuff that goes on in the world. But in the midst of all this stuff, we can live a different way. Because we lit that candle for peace this morning. And peace is an elusive word for many people. Many folks have made it their motto and spent millions of dollars on what they call world peace. Let's work for world peace. They even have peace prizes they give out for people that are working for world peace. And I don't mean to make fun of people, but for all the energy and dollars that have been spent on this concept of world peace, you would think they'd be a little bit closer to the goal. Or at least see the needle moving in the right direction. Instead, we have a world that is getting increasingly, increasingly more hostile because for every soul out there who wants peace, there's dozens that don't. And as we get into today's passage, Jesus tells the people that in a little while, they're not going to see him anymore. Now, that doesn't go over well with them. Jesus, when he starts talking about leaving, it doesn't make them happy. <clears throat> that doesn't bring them peace. You almost get a feel for how awkward the situation is in verse 19. <clears throat> Jesus can tell that they want to ask him about it. So there's obviously some side conversations happening here and there. And so he kind of lets them off the hook. He doesn't make them ask. <clears throat> he starts to explain to them, and he starts in his very familiar way. He says, I tell you the truth. Now, everything Jesus says is the truth. But when he says, I tell you the truth, we should, we should pause for a second and uh, pay attention. And take a drink. He said, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. That doesn't sound like fun. Yes, they're going to be pumped. We're going to be sad. <clears throat> Jesus was on the cross suffering for our sin. It's hard to fathom the level of grief <coughs> felt among his followers. Yeah, his mother had to be distraught. His disciples were all over the place. Judas chose a, a path that he chose. Peter's weeping bitterly. John is sitting with Jesus' his mother at the cross. The rest of them, we're not sure where they are, but they're grieving in that moment. But the world, the world, the world thinks that they've won. The enemy thinks they've won. They're rejoicing. Jesus' words would come true. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. Because they think they've gotten rid of Jesus. And ironically enough, they're still trying to get rid of Jesus. But it's just, it's just so funny. But what's the definition of insanity? 
And they keep on doing it. So, and so, and we just keep on worshiping Jesus. Because his people were indeed going to grieve while the world rejoiced. But though that wouldn't be the end of the story, would it? Far from the end of the story, Jesus tells them that they will grieve. There's no escaping grief. But their grief will turn to joy. And Jesus likens it to a woman giving, giving birth. The process can be a little painful and excruciating. Maybe some of you ladies can attest to that. But in the end, the joy of holding a newborn child far as outweigh the agony of the process. Right? When you hear people talk about their baby, they don't tell you how bad the process hurt. Do they? Very seldom do you get that part of the story. You get, the, you get to see the baby and you're like, wow, that's awesome. And newborn babies are pretty cool. Other people's newborn babies are even cooler because when they scream, <laughs> somebody else has to figure out what's going on. And that's okay. But Jesus is telling the disciples that's how it's going to be. Now is your time to grieve. It's not going to be easy or fun for a little while. But then when you see me again, it's time to rejoice. And we know today, now it's easy on this end, because we know today that Jesus, what he said, it, it played out. All right, we've got the, the, the empty grave is there to prove it, isn't it? But let's put ourselves in the first century hearing Jesus say this. What in the world does he mean? That's the overshadowing question here. That what, but Jesus keeps, tries to keep their attention on his return rather than how long it's going to be. What's he mean by a little while? We're not going to see him for a little while. Then we're going to see him. Well, how long was a little while? You know, it wasn't that long. It was just a couple of days, but they didn't know that. His return, which would be his resurrection from the dead, would bring great rejoicing. But it's better than that. They'll rejoice and no one it is, no one will take it away. Can you imagine that? Anything you have in life can be taken away. But that joy that Jesus brings, that peace that Jesus brings, can't be taken away. Now, you can give it away. You can surrender it, but it can't be taken from you. And we've all experienced things that rob us of our joy and our peace. And you can turn on the news any day and hear things that disturb any sense of happiness. And Jesus' death and resurrection has the power to keep that from happening. The Father wants to give them whatever they ask in Jesus' name. He wants what's best for his people. And once Jesus gets through them, that he's come from the Father, and he's returning to the Father, they understand. And they even say in verse 29, now you're speaking clearly. And without figures of speech. Don't you like it when people speak clearly and without figures of speech? <laughs> this makes us believe he came from God, they said. But it took a lot of effort on Jesus' part, but they finally got it. They finally get it. And Jesus says, you believe at last. <laughs> I almost say to Jesus, like, oh, Thank God, you people finally got this. Thank me, you people finally got this. But it's going to get tough for a little bit. A time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to your own place. You will leave me alone, Jesus says. Yet I am not alone, my Father is with me. And I have told you these things so that you may have peace, he says. Because in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I will overcome the world. That may, that's one of my favorite passages in Scripture. You know that. No, I don't like the trouble part. But I like to know that it's come. Right? We lit a candle for peace. And world peace, the way the world defines peace, is a pipe dream and a cliche. Pretty much is. The peace that Jesus speaks of is what only he can bring. He assures us that the reason he's telling us these things is so we can have peace. And I'm sure we all want peace. But we only find it in Jesus. He reassures his people, and I'll reassure you again that in this world you will have trouble. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you otherwise. I wish I could tell you that if you believe in Jesus, everything's going to go your way. There won't be any trouble. That just wouldn't be the truth. There's always going to be trouble. And it comes in all shapes and sizes. It affects everyone from every walk of life. Everyone's been hurt. Everyone's been broken by the troubles of life. But Jesus came to bring peace. He came to bring healing. You know, it's a choice to follow Jesus. You don't have to. It's a choice to experience healing. And only you can choose to follow Jesus. Nobody else can make you follow him for you. <clears throat> it's a choice. You have no control over what other people do to you. You have no control over what the world does to you, what the, what the troubles come on you, but you can control how you react to it, how you react in the midst of it. And there is peace in him. But only him. And again, I'm going to say it again. Jesus says, I told you these things. That if we have peace, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. 
And if Jesus has overcome the world and we are in him, guess where we are? We've overcome the world too through him. Because <clears throat> he faced the trouble. He faced it. The worst thing that can happen in this life is death. But the worst thing you can happen. And Jesus has been there. Jesus has done that and he's lived to tell them. He has overcome. And because of this, we can overcome too. We have peace in the midst of the world of trouble. Because we can't change the trouble. And I don't know about you, you probably have. I spent a lot of time and energy trying to fix all the trouble. And once you realize you can't fix the trouble, you can't make the trouble go away. You just choose to do it in Jesus. And it brings that peace because I'm not to fix all the trouble. Thank golly, I can't fix all the trouble. Sometimes I help cause the trouble. Sometimes it's my fault. <clears throat> not on purpose. But we can have peace in the midst of this. We can have healing in the midst of brokenness. And I hope we know that this morning. If you're not sure, and I, I, I said uh, a while back, I, um, I heard a song, and I just need to keep singing this song until I get there. I'm still singing some of those songs. Sometimes I'm singing three or four songs at once because you just need, we need to, if you're not in Him, just keep praying until you are. Because do you have the peace, the peace in Him? We need to get there. It's there. It's there. It's at the cross. It's all, every, every song we sing, everything we do, and that peace song, whether it's the Silent Night song, whatever song it is, you have to sing until you get there. Just Let's, we, we need to get there because I, I, I want you, I want us all to experience that peace that passes understanding. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for, for telling us these things and reassuring us, Lord, that um, no matter what happens, you have overcome. You have overcome, and Lord, and we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Lord. We can overcome too. Lord, and there's places, Lord, where we just don't have peace. Lord, and I'm sure we all have lists of places, Lord, where there are peace. We want to pray that you would, Lord, we would uh, fix our eyes on you, Lord, that we would be in you, and that, Lord, you would be, you would speak peace into those places in our lives that we that we don't have, that help us to be in you, to experience all that you want us to experience, Lord. We, you said if we ask it in your name, Lord, you will give it to us. We pray, Lord, for the peace, the peace, the hope, the joy, the love, the, the all the things that come from, from knowing you, Lord. In this world, there's trouble. Lord, we take heart this morning. You've overcome the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>